Jesus' disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. In response, he gave them what we know to be the Lord's Prayer. And then he went on to describe, through some parables, God's availability and his generosity. Listen now to the Word of God as it's in the 11th chapter of Luke, beginning with the fifth verse. Hear God's marvelous word. And Jesus said to them, Which of you have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is a friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. If a son asks for bread, from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him? Let us pray. O oh, gracious Lord, in these humble parables you've told us of the generosity, the availability of God. And in your name we come now to pray. Oh, Lord, we echo with your disciples. Teach us to pray. We need you, Lord. Show us what to say and how to say it. Speak through our prayers so that we will be able to reach the very heart of God. We open ourselves, mind, emotion, will, soul, body, the past, the future, everything, Lord. We commit them to you that we may receive your spirit and know how to pray. Amen. The success of prayer is measured not so much in what we get from God, but how much of God we get into ourselves. Prayer is not a gimme game, but a grace gift. Prayer is not so much being able to convince God of what we ought to have, but allowing him to convince us of what we need. That's the marvelous truth that Jesus has given us. When his disciples came saying, teach us to pray, his response was to give several parables in which he indicated that God never slumbers nor sleeps. He's always available. He's way beyond any friend. And there's no need for importunity or persistence to convince him to give us what we need. And then he shocks us into alertness with a couple of illustrations that curdle our blood inside. 
You know, a son asks for a piece of bread and a father gives a stone. Or asks for a, uh, an egg and gets a scorpion. We say, what father would do that? And suddenly Jesus has us. By a magnificent comparison, he's compared the mediocrity of our ability to give to God's limitless resources. And then he goes on to tell us, really, the secret of prayer. He says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him? What he's saying is that the purpose of prayer, the power of prayer, the progression of prayer is all a gift of the Holy Spirit. When we ask him to know how to pray, he gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ present with us, doing in us exactly what he did with his disciples, unleashing the same power that raised him from the dead, the same power that ascended on high, and the same power that returned at Pentecost. That's the power that comes to us and invites us into prayer and then guides our prayers. Prayer is to enlarge our hearts until they are able to contain the spirit of the living God. That's why we pray. Not just to give God a shopping list, but rather for him to tell us what he's ready to give. And he does that. I've always been amazed by this basic, simple thought. Listen to it. Three minutes after Pentecost, the disciples knew more of Jesus than they had known through three years of ministry with him along the dusty roads of Galilee. And the same Jesus they came to know personally after Pentecost is the same Jesus we can know. And the Lord promised through the Apostle Paul in the fourth chapter of Galatians, in that sixth verse, that God has sent the Spirit of his Son into us. So that's what prayer is, the Spirit of the Son coming into us, teaching us how to pray, but more than that, leading us through each step of prayer. Robert Murray McShane gave me an insight into the meaning of prayer that radically transformed my understanding. He said, if I could hear Jesus praying for me in another room, I could face 10 million enemies. Well, Jesus isn't in the next room. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If we open the door and invite him to come in, then prayer becomes a conversation with the living Lord. For the God of all creation who came in Jesus comes in the Holy Spirit, and he leads us step by step each step of the way through what it means to pray. So praying is not somehow getting God's attention. It's allowing him to lead us in asking what he's more ready to give than we are to ask. A tender thing was said by a son to his father. The son said, Dad, I appreciate all the good things you've given me, but what I really need is you. And another son said to that same father, after a period of rebellion, he said, you know, Dad, I really want to be like you. That's what prayer is. You see, the words Abba, Father, that Jesus says within us really mean Daddy in Greek. It's a word of intimacy and tenderness. Jesus comes within us to give us the ability to talk to God as our Father. And the steps that Jesus leads us through are eight marvelous, magnificent moments. They can change our lives. You see, the reason for these steps of prayer is that we've been powerfully created with a potential that can either make our life a glorious experience or lead us into damnation. God has entrusted us with the power of desire. 
and with the power of desire, our psychic and our physical energies draw out of life what we really want. The point is we're praying all the time because we're desiring all the time. Emerson was right. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire. And so night and day, sleeping and awake, we're all praying all the time because we're always desiring. Now the question is, do we desire the thing that he desires for us? And he gave us prayer because we can either ruin our lives or uplift our lives with the power of desire, will. And it's in prayer that he transforms our desires and shapes them around his desires for us so that we can become like him, want what he wants for us, experience his power flowing through us as a riverbed. Life can be totally different when we pray. When we come into the presence of Jesus, having been invited there by the Lord himself, the first thing he does is to teach us how to praise the Lord. Praise opens us up. It loosens the tissues of our brains so that we can think God's thoughts. The more we adore the Lord, the more like him we become, and the more ready we are to receive the specific guidance that he has to give. Will you do something for me this next week and for yourself? I want you to start with the 95th Psalm and move through the 100th Psalm. Six Psalms, one for each day, that will enable you, by the time we are together again, to be a different person. The psalmist soars in magnificent praise, singing a new song to the Lord, telling the Lord how glorious he is, receiving his power in his life and doing the impossible because of him. I once took a course on conversation and I was told that the only way to have a good conversation is to establish with another person your trust in that person and your feeling of value about that person. And then as a result, the person opens up and a good exchange takes place. Adoration is establishing the worth of God. Worship, worth, shape in the ancient English means exactly that. When we adore the Lord, we establish a relationship and he begins to flow into our lives. But once we see him as he is and know his holiness, his glory and his power, it's then that we want to confess anything in us that is wrong. Adoration leads to confession. But the Lord must tell us what to confess. We'll go into his presence saying, these are the things that keep me from you or from any other human being. These are the sins, the missings of the mark that have taken place during this past week. But then he goes deeper to show us the inner motivation, what really caused those things. We'll go in complaining, thinking we're confessing about a broken relationship, and he'll ask us, what caused that? What did you do? How did that person get that way? We'll go into his presence talking about a problem that seems insolvable, and suddenly he'll ask us, what did you cause, do to cause that? And what do you want to do to allow me to be the solution of that? The word in Hebrew for confession means to point to. In Greek, it means to say after. So real confession is hearing the Lord tell us what we need to confess. He goes layer after layer, deeper and deeper, until finally he unearths the inner thing inside of us that really is causing our problem, the pride, the selfishness the willfulness, the determination to run our own lives. The longer we linger with the Lord in confession, the more he gives us what we are to confess. So very often we think we have to confess in order to establish a relationship. Not at all. He comes within us. We confess those surface things, and then he starts to penetrate deeper and deeper. You see, he's up to a great thing in us. He wants to make us like himself. Isn't that wonderful? Would you like that to happen? I do. And that's why we pray. And flowing out of confession comes thanksgiving. The real motivation for thanksgiving is that we've been forgiven. Remember what the Lord said to the people just before they crossed over the Jordan? 
He said, consecrate yourself, for tomorrow I will do great things among you. The Hebrew word for consecrate means cut. Cut. Cut the memory of the past and trust me for the future. That's what Thanksgiving really is. It's remembering to thank the Lord for his forgiveness and cutting the memory and the hurt and the pain that went with whatever it was that separated us from him. We remember the marvelous words of the psalmist in the 106th Psalm in that first verse, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. It's the mercy of the Lord that causes our thanksgiving to know that we're forgiven. Are you finished with the past? Or are you taking it with you into the today and tomorrow? Are you dragging the hurts and all of the pain of yesterday? No wonder tomorrow is no better than yesterday. Confession and then thanksgiving cleanses us. But it's after we say thanks to the Lord that we're ready then to make a commitment of the things that really trouble us. Remember the psalmist saying, commit your way to the Lord, trust only in him, and he will direct your paths. Commitment to the Lord is entrusting to him what it is that troubles us. It means that we come into his presence with tight fists, and inside of those fists are the things that we're hanging on to, saying, I've got to take care of it myself. And no longer we're in God's presence. Suddenly our hands open and we drop those things. Prayer gives us the freedom to commit them to him. And then as the commitment takes place, a wonderful thing happens. He uses meditation. Keep meditation at the center of your prayers. Everything leads up to it and everything flows from it. It's the headwater from which the fresh streams flow. And we believe that in meditation in prayer, the Lord actually guides the thoughts as they develop so that we know what to ask. Remember those marvelous words of the psalmist? Meditation changes the thoughts of my mind. The more we meditate, the more we are able actually to receive what God wants in those situations that we've committed to him. Now, if we rush ahead with prayers of intercession and supplication before we've meditated, all we have to do is rehearse our old, tired-out theories and insights. Wonderful things have happened in the scientific world when people have studied and thought and investigated, and then new thought has come. The same thing happens to us in our problems. The Lord gives us something that we'd never thought of before. The creator of the universe is able to impute thought in us so that our prayers are in keeping with what he wants. And then we can pray prayers of intercession. Jesus is the great intercessor, and he prays those prayers of intercession through us. For he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he ever makes intercession for us. That marvelous word from Hebrews 7, verse 25, calls us to our ministry in cooperation with him. Peter, in the second chapter of his first letter in the ninth verse, calls us the royal priesthood. We have been given power power to go to God on behalf of people and then receive his power and go to people. We are the priests of God. What a tragedy it is that we don't use that power that's given to us. The same power that dwelt in Jesus is ours. The power to heal, the power to love, the power to forgive, the power to change human beings, the power to change relationships and to do what we might think is impossible. We are the priests of God, ordained by the Holy Spirit, set apart by the Holy Spirit, encouraged to pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's only then, you see, after we have been a priest for someone else, that we can stretch out before the Lord anything that troubles us in our own lives. But now we have the wisdom as to how to pray. The Spirit has been teaching us what we are to say. It's as if Jesus puts his arm around us and says, Now, my dear friend, I've been listening to you 
Now listen to me. I want to tell you about this problem you've been talking about. Now ask the Lord for this and he'll answer you. Take that direction and he'll bless you. He's right there with us. He's our friend, our shepherd. He won't let us go. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We've got a wonderful friend when it comes to prayer. And he helps us. And then he says, now will you dare to implement what I've told you to do? That's where dedication comes. Certainly spending a period of time in prayer and not following the orders that we've been given will debilitate the next time of prayer. And very often we come into the presence of the Lord not having done what he told us to do. And he says, now listen, get back and do the thing I told you to do the last time. And until we do it, we can't receive fresh grace. Dedication is doing what he tells us to do as our part in the implementation. A little boy went to his daddy while he was working at a desk. And uh, the little boy said, Daddy, and the father looked down and handed him a piece of candy. And he said, Daddy, took out a favorite uh, thing out of his desk and handed it to him. He said, Daddy. And then he got his prized possession. He was a doctor, and he took his stethoscope out and gave it to the little boy. <laughs> the little boy said, Daddy, I want you, not anything you give. And he climbed up in his lap and he hugged him. That's what prayer is, not what God gives. Not what we get out of him, but what he puts in to us.